Welcome to Eco Ask Why, a podcast that dives into industrial manufacturing topics and spotlights the heroes that keep America running. I'm your host, Chris Granger, and on this podcast, we do not cover the latest features and benefits on products that come to market. Instead, we focus on advice and insight from the top minds of industry because people and ideas will be how America remains number one in manufacturing in the world. Welcome to Eco Ask Why. We're continuing our Women in Engineering series today, and we have an exciting guest with us. So we have Linda Freeman, who is an industry manager at Rockwell Automation. So welcome, Linda. Hi, thanks for having me today. Oh, we're very excited to have you. I hope, hope you're doing well today. I am. I am. Very good. Well, this has been a fun series for, for us to record and work with people on and, and so excited to get the, the message out about the, the women in engineering and love to start these episodes just by giving our listeners a little bit of your background and, and the journey to the role that you're in now. Okay, great. Thanks. So, yeah, I, I was one of those kids in high school that I, just, I didn't know what I was going to do. Uh, I grew up in South Georgia. And didn't really know what I was going to do in college or where I was going to go or what kind of career. I just knew I wanted to go off to college. And so I applied to two different universities, Georgia Tech and UGA. And I was like, okay, well, whichever one comes back first, uh, that's where I'll go. And luckily, Georgia Tech beat UGA by a day in my acceptance letter. And I go off to Georgia Tech and I'm like, hmm, okay. Uh, oh, this is an engineering school. Okay, well, yeah, I, I, I like math and science and I like puzzles and I like solving things and I like electricity. So I guess I'll do electrical engineering. And, and honestly, that is how I fell into it. I look back at my high school career and I didn't really have any role models or people that worked in industry and our counselors at our school really didn't know about STEM type fields. So that's what's driven a lot of my volunteerism I do now is, is I want to do that for kids that I didn't have a chance when I was younger. So I go off to college and Georgia Tech has a really strong co-op and intern program. So I did an internship with Procter & Gamble making Dawn dishwashing liquid. And I just absolutely fell in love with manufacturing. I just thought it was the coolest thing ever to see these raw materials come in on a truck and a couple hours later, you know, poof, here comes a, a bottle of Dawn flying off the line at, you know, hundreds of bottles a minute. It was just amazing. I just loved it. So when I was graduating college, uh, I would definitely wanted to work in manufacturing. And when I ran into Rockwell Automation, and they told me I could have a job where I get to go to different plants every day and help people solve problems. And it's a combination of working with people and doing technical engineering. I was like, hey, sign me up. And I've been doing it now. This will be my 24th year working for Rockwell, um, doing technical sales with the company. And I just love it. And I was fortunate enough to move to Florida back in 2000 and little did I know that in Florida, our biggest customers are the amusement parks? Uh, you might not think about it every day when you go to an amusement park, but what makes the roller coaster go? What makes it stop? Well, there's a control system behind it, and it's the same type of control system that's used in food plants and water wastewater plants. So I started learning more about the amusement industry, and a few years ago, that's when I moved into the industry manager role. And what I do in that job is I support the company and the industry and help customers all around the world. Uh, create new attraction experiences for guests. And I work on our future technology roadmaps to ensure we're doing everything we can uh, to help that industry be safe and effective. Wow. So right now you're going from that, for your industry role, you're, you're all over. You, you don't have a specific geography. Is that correct? Yeah. So I mainly focus in North America, but I support companies around the world, but I am industry focused. So I am working with theme parks, amusement parks, water parks. Uh, have you ever thought about when you go to a Broadway show, what moves the curtain across the screen or what makes the stage move up and down? So we do lots of things in live entertainment, ski resorts, adventure courses, um, indoor skydiving. So all the type of leisure activities. So we call it the entertainment industry. All that lumps up into entertainment. Gotcha. Very cool. And so recap. Georgia Tech girl. Sounds like you had a good time at Georgia Tech. Is that a fun college? <laughs> it is an engineering school. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yes, I did enjoy my time at, at Georgia Tech. I got involved and I would encourage students that are going to college, you know, get involved in trade associations. I joined IEEE when I was in college. I joined Society of Women Engineers. I learned a lot of my soft skills and met a lot of great people and learned a lot about career options and career jobs 
from those activities. So looking back on my college time, that was probably what I enjoyed the most was the people and the professionals that I met through the volunteerism I did through societies. Right, right. Very good. And you're in a very interesting industry right now. You know, what are you seeing as some of the challenges that that your specific customers are facing? Well, the thing that's changing in industrial automation, so no matter what industry you're in, whether you build machines for food plants or you build machines for chemical plants or water wastewater treatment plants, we've got this internet of things going on. So I always like to use the analogy of my watch. You know, I used to wear a dumb watch and and now I wear this dumb, meaning that it only told me the time. And now I wear this smart watch. I wear a Garmin watch and it tells me how well I slept last night, how many steps I've taken, what's my stress level, how well did I exercise this week? So there's all this this data. And now that I have this data, I can make more data-driven decisions. Oh, my watch is telling me I didn't sleep good last night and I am feeling kind of tired today. And I really did work out a lot the last three days. Well, I should probably take today off so I can make that data-driven decision. And that's what I'm really seeing change in whether it's what we're doing with safety systems on amusement rides or whether it's machinery being built for other industries. The technology is changing really fast. And we need new skill sets for the people working in industry to know how to bring that data in, what to do with that data, how to make decisions based off that data. And the other thing that's changing is career jobs are changing. I'm, I'm watching the companies that I work with. They're having to reorganize and think about new business titles and think about structuring and funding in different ways, all because of this technology shift. You'll hear it referred to as Industry 4.0 or Industrial Internet of Things, but it's all the same thing. It's more data is available to make better decisions. No doubt. I mean, you, you spoke about a couple items that we we see as a recurring theme about the changing technology and the skill sets that are needed. So that is a challenge, no doubt, that uh, industry is facing. But you know, talking about it and making people aware. And also, I, the one piece that you brought up, Linda, the, the career jobs, and, and they're, they're changing. I mean, even at ECO, we have some roles now that we didn't have five years ago as just mm-hmm. a, a basic distributor. You know, and mm-hmm. you look at some of these roles, well, they're, they were created because of a need and the, the changing, the, the way the market is changing. So, uh, you know, great insight there. And thank you for bringing that to the attention of our listeners for sure. Okay. So, you know, with this, with this series, we're trying to inspire women and, and help them understand what's going on with the industry, give them some tips and some pointers. So for the, the women that may be listening, what's some advice you would give them about entering industry? Okay. So what what is it that makes manufacturing and industrial automation awesome for women? Great question. Humans love to have a purpose in life. And I think women were especially drawn to that. You know, we're natural nurturers. And when I look at the career that I've had in manufacturing, I've been able to directly look at my work and know how I was able to help nurture the world, whether it was bringing clean water, bringing food, bringing medical supplies. You know, manufacturing really is what makes our world what it is today. So it's very rewarding to know that my work helps to improve the life of someone else. And I, I think for women, That's something that we always want to go home with that day. You know, why why did we go to work that day? What purpose did we have? And this is definitely an industry where you can draw that line from your work to having an impact in the world. Oh, that's great. I mean, you spoke straight to purpose right there. I mean, that that was wonderful. And there there may be obstacles as well, though. So what what could they potentially face, you know, when they're coming into industry? Well, you know, I, I got to give a hats off to you for doing this series because by you doing this series, you're actually addressing what I consider to be one of the biggest obstacles, and that's role models. There's a, a hashtag, you know, see her, be her. People don't think to do something unless maybe they've seen that someone else has done it. And so, as women working in this industry, we need to be getting out and talking about what we do, volunteering in our communities going to our kids' schools and, and mentioning what we do for our jobs. Because it's not until more women see that women actually work in this industry that they're going to want to come to the industry. And then once you get in the industry, 
finding good mentors and advocates and role models to help you get over any of those learning curves. You know, sometimes uh, there might be more men in the room than women, but that's okay. And any person can be your advocate or your mentor. So you don't have to, I think some women kind of get hung up on, oh, I have to have a female mentor. No, a mentor is a person that is invested in helping you increase your potential that is not placed upon gender. And so having more role models, finding role models for yourselves, and then things like this podcast series, just having things out in the world that people can see that this is a great place for women to work. No doubt. And thank you so much for that, for the kind words there, Linda. But and you also mentioned mentors and advocates. Does anyone stand out in your career that you would like to recognize that has helped you and shaped you to, throughout your career? Oh, wow. You know, I don't think I can think of just one person. I always look to learn from everyone I interact with. You can learn things to do and things not to do. And especially when I meet somebody new, I always try to ask them for, hey, what's your one wisdom or what's your area to help in? And and so I'd say that over my career, the, the people that I lean on the most, it frequently changes and it kind of changes on, on the situation I'm based in. So like, for instance... I've never recorded a podcast before. And so, you know, to prepare for this, I thought in my life, okay, who's someone who records podcasts and who can I go talk to, to give me some advice and some pointers on how to record a good podcast. And so I think it's always looking at what's the thing that you're working on that moment and who's someone that you know in your network that you can then go ask them a question to help you get through that moment more efficiently and more effectively and have more more impact in what you're doing. and But you can only do that, though, by growing your network. So that's the other thing I would encourage is that you're not going to have options for good mentors if your network is small. So I'd say that's another thing that, that I've always focused on is meeting new people and reaching out because you just you never know what you're going to learn from somebody. Absolutely. I mean, and for our listeners, I mean, don't be afraid to, to reach out. Linda and I were talking to each other. I mean, we we met each other by reaching by me reaching out to someone who connected me with her and overcome that fear. Reach out, make that connection point, you know, always be learning. So great. That's, that's some great uh, advice there, Linda. Good stuff. Yeah, thanks. And and you mentioned you're getting over your fear. I, I would definitely say that's been one of my if I look back in my career like what would be one of my biggest failures or something that I learned from is I really wish earlier in my career, I would have been more confident, more confident in my voice, more confident in the fact that it's okay to ask questions, more confident in sharing my ideas and just more confident in growing my network. You know, I think I could have worked through some hurdles earlier in my career um, had I reached out more and, and asked questions more. So that would be a piece of advice I would share with people. Well, speak to us about the confidence thing. What, what what do you think helped you overcome that? You know, I went <laughs> I went through some training, a company called Landmark Education, and it's a it's a three day workshop you go through, and it's for like personal development. and And what they taught me in that workshop is everybody's scared, everybody has confidence issues. So if everybody has a confidence issue, then why be worried about yours if you know everybody else around you has one? And that was what, what really changed for me because I thought that I was the only person in the room that didn't know that everybody else had all the answers. And so once I saw that, that everybody questions, everybody doesn't know. And the more that you're willing to admit and share that you don't know something, then that person will be comfortable sharing what they know and what they don't know. And who knows, maybe you find out that you're able to exchange info and now you both have just solved your problems. So that, that was the big kind of aha moment for me. Very good. Very good. I think that speaks to uh, humility as well. Being able to, to know, be comfortable where you are, be humble enough to ask though, right? Being yeah. not, not afraid to ask those questions and to put yourself out there. So that's great insight there, Linda. Thank you. So as we're walking through this for, for the women listeners, there are a lot of myths out there uh, about industry and, and, and how women are treated. And what, what would be one that you'd want to debunk 
if you you know you have the chance right now to really st- to throw down on this topic, anything that you want to say, you know what people think this is reality, but this is not. This is this is this is the real world. Yeah. Anytime I hear somebody say the statement of, "Well, this isn't a place for us," or "This isn't a place for women," that's not true. It might have been true, you know, honestly, fifteen years ago, ten years ago, twenty years ago, but it's not today. There is a fair and even place for everyone to do their best work and look for companies that that's part of what they market and what they say. And so that that would be the one myth I'd want to debunk. And if anybody does say that to you, just think in your head, oh, oh, they don't know. They haven't been educated yet. They don't know that there is a place for everyone. So also take the opportunity to maybe show that person a different side and a different viewpoint. It's not until we, when we hear that, we challenge it, that it's ever going to change. Right. Take that stand. No doubt. I mean, it's great stuff there. You know, what about, you know, Linda, when you look back across your career, have there been any resources or, or areas that have helped you along the way as you've developed into the professional that you are? Yeah, so I mentioned one of them, Landmark Education. I did a lot of their professional development courses, and that really helped me to hear the voice in my head and realize that sometimes when somebody does something, you know, I might put some meaning to it that that's not really was their intention. That's what I'm thinking their intention was. But if I just focus on the task and I focus on possibilities and I focus on outcome and I don't heart myself in the past and think about my failures that I'll be able to accomplish a lot more. So going through that education, that was a real life turner for me. And and I didn't do it until, you know, kind of midway through my career. I wish I'd have done it earlier in my career. The other places would be professional trade associations. So whatever industry you work in, there's always some kind of trade association. So I work in the theme park business And in the theme park business, our trade association is the International Association of Amusement Parks and Attractions. So it's IAPA. It's a global association. And I have just met wonderful people being a part of that society, but then also stepping up and volunteering, volunteering to be on a committee, volunteering to speak at a conference. I have found that those times in my life where I actually learned the most was when I stepped up and did something a little bit outside my comfort zone because I got to interact with people that I don't normally interact with, or I forced myself to go really learn a topic really well, because I was going to speak about it at a conference. So using those professional societies, that's a great place. The other thing would be volunteerism in your community. You know, what can you do within your community? So for me, uh, my community is I do a lot with FIRST Robotics. I love helping high school kids to get excited about machinery and helping them see future careers. And then Also in my work, volunteerism in safety standards development. Um, Every industry you work in, there is some kind of safety standard you have to follow. I would bet that most people listening to this podcast has heard of NFPA 79, right? We all have to follow NFPA 79. Well, there's thousands of other standards out there that industries follow. So again, I work in amusement. So for me, that's ASTM and the committee's F24. So I've been volunteering in that committee for a couple of years. And what's neat about standards development volunteerism is the people that go do that, they're usually the most experienced people. They're some of the smartest people. They're people that have great ideas and they want to help make the world a safer place. So it's a great way to learn and just a great way to network. So for me, that's my volunteerism. I'd say that's where I really... That and the education I did with Landmark, those, those are the things that have made the biggest impact in my career. Absolutely. I mean, that's great, great advice. I mean, volunteering on a professional standpoint as well as personal. You know, I love how you said, uh, get outside your comfort zone. So what, how did you feel yourself grow in those opportunities? I mean, what did you learn from, from the, I sound like, were they speaking engagements that you, that you <clears throat> kind of volunteered for? Yeah, yeah. So speaking at conferences, um, speaking at seminars. So I'm a runner. I I do triathlons and I like to run. So I'll I'll use a running analogy when you talk about getting out of your comfort zone. I remember the first time I did my first little three mile 5k race, you know, I I thought I was going to pass out. Like it was crazy. But every day you run a little bit further, 
you do it a little bit longer, you know, another year goes by, another year goes by. Now I'm doing six miles. I'm doing 13 miles. Next thing you know, I'm running a marathon, which I never thought I would do. Getting out of your comfort zone is the same thing. Every time it feels a little scary, but every time you're able to push your limits just a little bit more, just a little bit more. So it's like a muscle. And the more you use that muscle and the more you stretch it, the better it'll become. And so if you never get out of your comfort zone, your capabilities and your skill sets will never grow. But the more often you get out of your comfort zone in just tiny little increments and consistently do that over time, then your skill set will compound exponentially over time. That is great. Thank you. I mean, thank you for that. And great analogy. Just started some running myself. I'll have to get some pointers from you as we go. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Our executive producer tricked me into this, so uh, we, we we have somewhat of a little bit of a game back and forth with where each morning, you know, we're sending pictures of our runs, but uh, yep, hopefully, yep. Uh, but I, I do know, you're right, though, you know, when we first started, it was, you know, half mile and then a mile, and then last week I did a, a five mile run, and I actually did it and didn't die, which was kind of cool, so... <laughs> you well, and you just And you just brought up another great point, having an accountability partner. Sometimes it's, it's difficult to get out of your comfort zone for yourself, but you'll do it for a friend. And so a lot of times when I've signed up for conferences to speak on something that I don't know anything about, I sign up with a friend and we commit to do it together. Hey, we're going to go in and co-present on this topic. So you go read this book. I'll read this book. We'll work on the presentation together. And my running happened the same way. I, I also got tricked by a friend. And so if you want to get out of your comfort zone, finding an accountability friend to walk that journey with you, because they're going out of their comfort zone too, but they don't want to let you down either. So it, it makes it a lot more productive, I've found, when I, when I have that accountability partner. No doubt. And even to this podcast, it, it, this, the same uh, accountability partner, I mean, we, we push each other. You know, this is something six months ago in the beginning of, of 2020, 2020. We didn't have a podcast, so it's all been new, getting out of our comfort zone, new ideas, new concepts. Uh, we challenge each other, but it's a good balance, too. So you're so right. I mean, having that accountability partner, so important, so important. So, you know, thank you for, for taking us a little bit further down that with that conversation there, Linda. That was great. <laughs> So when you're in, when you're at work and you're enjoying what you're doing and you're you're getting a sense of joy and a sense of fulfillment in your work, what exactly are you doing at that moment? Oh, I've helped somebody solve a problem, and I see the excitement in their face because they had hit a stumbling block or a roadblock and and felt they couldn't move forward, and now all of a sudden they've got an idea of how to move forward, and they get excited, and they're ready to go on to the next hurdle. To me, that and that's the that's the fun part about manufacturing. You know, every day in some more industrial automation, you know, we're trying to solve a problem. We're trying to make something better. We're trying to prove upon something. If you were the kid that loved to take things apart and know how they worked and try to make them better and try to put them back together, or maybe you were just the person that liked to take things apart and know how they work. You know, there's there's all kinds of different jobs in in manufacturing and industrial automation, but that's that's where I get. The most satisfaction is when I've taken that thing apart and then figured out a better way to put it back together and help someone do that. And then they're excited because now they can go on to the next thing. No doubt. Very fun. Good stuff. So any any highlights in your career that you'd like to share with our listeners? Um, so I, I've been really fortunate to bring some amazing attractions to life. I get to work with some of the global operators of theme parks around the world. And um, if you've been to Florida any time in the last 10 years and gone on a new attraction, I, I probably had an opportunity to work on some piece of that. And it's the greatest satisfaction when, when you work in that industry. I had an opportunity on one project. It was, it was a really big project, never been done before. We were very nervous and it was opening day and I got to go stand on the unload platform when the very first guests were getting off the ride. Oh, just to think about it right now, it gives me chill bumps. And, and to see these people come off the ride with these huge smiles on their faces and they were so excited and they were so happy. I forgot about the months and months of long work and late nights and stressful meetings and sleepless nights. It, it just all went away 
knowing that I was able to, you know, I had a little part in putting that smile on that person's face. So that's been a lot of fun. I, I had the opportunity to work with NASA Kennedy Space Center during the shuttle program. And we worked on the automation systems for all the launch pads on the shuttle program. So being able to go to those launches and, and be a part of launching people into space, like that was that was amazing. And then one of the things I'm working on now that is just so personally gratifying and so exciting is through my work with ASTM, we've created this uh, program where we're bringing college kids in to our meetings because we've we've got an aging workforce challenge. You know, a lot of the people that work in standards developments, you know, we're kind of getting a little bit older and as technology is changing, we're not as updated on technology. So we've really got to get some age diversification in our standards development communities. So being able to create that next generation of people that are going to volunteer and, and create safety standards to make the world a safer place, that's been a ton of fun to work in that area. That sounds awesome. That sounds like a great opportunity. And, you know, it's just uh, hats off to you guys for recognizing that and, and opening the doors to bring in to shape those minds and get that insight that they're bringing as well. So that's yeah. great. That's great. Now, we, we love to take these these episodes, Linda, and get a little bit off the, the, the professional path and just mm -hmm. learn a little bit. Now, you you already shared you're a runner. Any other hobbies you'd like to uh, share with our listeners? <laughs> Yeah, so I, I started running and then made the mistake one day of saying something to a friend that I didn't know how to swim and I was scared. And uh, she challenged me and she says, well, you got to go conquer your fears. You, you got to go do a triathlon. So I got into triathlons to overcome my fears. I wasn't really a good biker. I didn't really know how to swim. I was in my late 30s. <laughs> so I did it to, to conquer my fears. But surprisingly, the, I gained the skills of time management, self-care, prioritization, and then I also met a wonderful worldwide community of friends. Um, and it was also, it helped me, again, it was a place where I could practice stretching that, you know, uncomfortableness. I remember when I did my first triathlon at the end of the race, I literally cried. I was so exhausted. And I said, I'm never doing this again. This was so hard. And three years later, I did an Ironman, which never in my wildest dreams did I ever think that was going to happen. And, and just going through that growth experience of learning how to, to manage all the time it takes to devote to train for that, to take care of myself, to prioritize the right way, the time management. I, I got so much more out of doing triathlon than I ever thought I would. So, yeah, that's that's my hobby now. It's become a lifestyle. My my <laughs> my hobby has become a lifestyle. <laughs> wow, that is awesome. That, that sounds like just a, a, a well, it sounds intense for one. So when was the last triathlon you did? I actually got right before, uh, you know, we're in 2020 this year. So COVID shut down a lot of races. I had a bunch of races on the calendar this year that were canceled. So uh, my friends and I got together just a few weeks ago and we're like, you know what? race has been canceled, but that doesn't mean we can't do a race ourselves. So we just put one on ourselves. So we're continuing to train and, and exercise and support each other, you know, even though there's not a, a competition. Life yeah. is a competition in and of itself, right? That's right. I mean, I was going to ask you too, with gyms being shut down, you know, how, how, how are you going about your training right now? <laughs> so my home office is like a home office slash gym. I've got a standing treadmill desk. So I walk during the day when I'm in meetings. I've got my bike on a bike trainer. I set up a little workout area in the corner. And fortunately, I live in Florida where we have tons of lakes. And so I can swim all the time. And so I'd say that the one thing COVID has brought to me is adaptability. You know, our lives kind of got turned upside down. But how do you then adapt and try something different and try something new to still accomplish the same goals. And again, having those accountability friends, you know, having the group that I work out with and my friends that are there with me every day and we're cheering each other on. That's, that's, yeah, we've kept the training alive. That is awesome. Well, hats off to you and hope, wish Thanks. you the best with in your future triathlons. That's great. I, I'm not there yet, but um, you, you may be convincing <laughs> me to try one. So <laughs> it's a lot of fun. There you go. Well, uh, we'll just move on. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit of fun. 
<laughs> so we, we also love to have these episodes to share a little bit of our families. Anything you like to share there? Yeah. So I'm actually, I'm a dual citizen. Uh, my father's American and my mother's Brazilian. So on my mother's side of the family, um, I'm a first generation American. And I think growing up with a different cultural perspective, it provided me some really unique insights to how small our world is, but also how different our world is. Um, so that's one thing that's kind of unique about me. And then I personally, I haven't had any children. And so I foster kind of that mothering instinct a lot with my volunteerism. Um, mentoring high school students and college students, mentoring kids of my friends, mentoring kids of my coworkers, even even kids of my customers. Like my customers will call me up now and go, hey, um, I know you love mentoring. Would you be willing to talk to my daughter? <laughs> um, so I do that a lot because I, you know, I want to pay back for those that helped me along the way, but also just open up the eyes um, to other people. So yeah, that's that's a little bit about my my family life. Yeah, it's very cool. I mean, and, and you know, being a mentor to to young people is so important. Got to pass it down and, and help uplift and guide. There's so many decisions out there that young people are faced with, and it's easy to make the wrong one. So listening to someone like you and uh, the success you've had and continue to have, I uh, can't I can't imagine you're, you're you're just pouring positive energy and insight into them. So thank you for that. Um, <laughs> we also love to, for our listeners to know a little bit about, you know, what you're curious about, what would you point them to any books, any podcasts out, outside of eco as why we know they're already binging that anything oh, yeah. that you would, uh, would, would recommend, uh, for our listeners to, to check out. Oh, definitely. So for women specifically two places, so society of women engineers, um, has a great series of podcasts that interviews different women that work in industry and topics that are interesting to diversity and inclusion in the workforce. And I would actually encourage everybody to listen to those podcasts. If you're looking to increase diversity and inclusion efforts within your company activities, that podcast is a great resource. Another great resource, I actually, Fairy God Boss, yeah, fairygodboss.com. They have a great series of podcasts that talks about different industries and different jobs. I personally like to listen to uh, Gary John Bishop. He's just a personal coach. Um, I met him through my work with Landmark Education, and he always helps to put the mind kind of in the, in the right mindset of accomplishing your goals and figuring out your opportunities and, and helping to release your, your full potential. So those are, those are some of my favorites. Very cool. There's some great ones there. That's awesome. And we, we can put some of those in the show notes as well for our listeners to check out. The the, the Society of Women Engineering, we're very familiar. Uh, and hopefully they'll check out this podcast and they'll like what they hear as well with uh, with this series. So that's great. So, Linda, we always we, we try to wrap up Eco Ask Why with the why, getting down to the purpose. So very curious for you. You know, why do you enjoy the path you're on and what drives you? I enjoy the fact that Every day I get to solve a problem, and every day it's a different problem. Um, sometimes it's people problems, sometimes it's technology problems, sometimes it's operations, sometimes it's quality, but every day is something different. And I feel that keeps my mind fresh, and I, I really enjoy that. And then working in industrial automation, we are working with leading edge technology to solve some of the world's biggest problems. And so that's, that's just fun. That's fun to be able to say, hey, I get to work with the coolest technology to solve problems and it's going to impact the world. That, that's what keeps me going. And then me specifically working in the amusement industry that you know, relates all the way down to helping. We talk about putting smiles on people's faces and creating memories for families. Find what that thing is that you do in your job that impacts people. So I know for me, that's what I do. If you work in a pharmaceutical plant, that drug is helping to keep someone alive that's creating memories for families when they sit down at the table to have dinner. If you work in the forest products industry and you work in a, in a sawmill, you're creating building materials that creates jobs for people, that build homes for people, that give them shelter. So always try to get down to that real heartfelt impact of what you do because every one of us does have an impact. But I think sometimes we get so busy and wrapped up in our day-to-day -day work that we forget what that impact is. So I encourage everyone to go find that and talk to that. Linda, that was probably one of the best why 
answers we've we've had on the podcast. <laughs> that was great. I mean, you speak to the impact, the, the purpose in people's lives, the impact they're making in others. You're not just on a floor in a plant. You're making a much bigger impact on the world than you realize. So, yeah. you know, yeah. hats off to you. That was that that was awesome. So, thank you. <laughs> well, this, well, I hope you can take it to heart. No doubt, no doubt. And this has been an absolute pleasure. You've been a wonderful guest, and, and I hope you've enjoyed this experience. And, and I'm very excited for our listeners to uh, to to hear your story here. Thank you so much again for creating this series. I I can't emphasize enough. See her, be her. Women need role models. So thank you so much uh, to Eco for creating this podcast series. Thank you for listening to Eco Ask Why. This show is supported ad-free by Electrical Equipment Company. Eco is redefining the expectations of an electrical distributor by placing people and ideas before products. Please subscribe and share with your colleagues and friends. Also, leave comments, feedback, and any new topics that you would like to hear. To learn more or to share your insights, visit ecosy.com. That's E-E-C-O-A-S-K-S-W-H-Y.com. 